Okay. Um, so today, I mean, I, I will, um, I mean, our program is that of the one of uh, calculating electronic properties of solids and uh, using some what we can call a form first principle method, uh, which means some accurate methods uh, trying to solve the Fournier equation for the electrons in the solids. Uh, uh, as you all know, I mean, the, the, the most widely approach for doing that for solids is uh, DFT or eventually some variant of uh, many body perturbation theory like uh, GW or better Salpeter equation, things like that. And uh, here we are in the context of some, uh, I would say, some recent works developed by a number of groups in the world. Uh, uh, these last, uh, I would say, five or ten years, which aim at uh, uh, using a correlated methods uh, to go uh, beyond uh, DFT or GW. Um, as you know, the main motivation is the fact that for several uh, systems uh, with uh, what we call strongly correlated uh, uh, aspects, um, DFT and other methods have some difficulty to to, to reproduce because of this strong correlation. So it's useful to try to, to go beyond. Um, so um, what I'm going to do today is just to uh, present you um, our attempt in this uh, recent attempt to uh, combine in uh, a configuration interaction for and QMC for, for solids in order to try to devise something which could give some more insight in the, these uh, difficult systems. Um, so in this talk, uh, there will have two parts. Uh, the first part is, uh, I would say, a general part. Um, and the second one would be uh, applied to, uh, I'll show, uh, show you some numbers for uh, the first system we looked at in detail, which is a, a carbon diamond, uh, infinite solid. And uh, we, of course, which is a, a test case, which is quite interesting because we, have, we know quite well the system and uh, many people have tried their method there. So it's a uh, first step. Uh, we're working now on some uh, strongly correlated system, but uh, my results are too preliminary and uh, I, won't, uh, I won't, uh, won't talk about that today. Okay, um, so uh, I want to be, I mean, the first part is the most interesting part and I, I decided to do something uh, uh, a little different from what people are usually do. And uh, what I'm going to do is, is, uh, is really to try to take a perspective of, of a quantum chemist, uh, which, is, um, which knows how to make uh, electronic calculation, CI calculation, say, configuration interaction calculation for a molecule, a finite molecule. And we would like to, to do some infinite solid, correlated infinite solid. Of course, <laughs> this was my way of doing things uh, when I started this work. And I must say that uh, uh, there were quite a, a few aspects of, of, of the problem which was not clear for me, and uh, even some elementary stuff. So it was an opportunity for me to try to understand. And uh, so uh, this talk is, uh, this first part is a reflect of that. I would say that it's a reflect of the testimony to my non-understanding of some basic aspects of uh, three state physics. So, but uh, during that, I, I learned a few points which are not so, in fact, even for people who are used to do uh, DFT calculation and solids, was not so trivial. So I'm happy to try to give you this information. So in any case, it would be, I think, useful for young people or for people who don't know the, that kind of uh, calculation. And, uh, and maybe a few points would be useful also for people who are very uh, accustomed with that kind of things. So uh, sorry for the most expert one if, if I'm saying two trivial things, but I think it's, it can be of interest for, for some people. Okay, so before beginning, just to say that uh, uh, this work is a collaboration between several groups, in, uh, mostly in the United States. And the main contributors are Kevin Gasperich and Anwar Benali, which are at Argonne Lab in Chicago. And there's some support for some money from uh, a PIX uh, collaboration, uh, CNRS USA and some uh, AMR. And also some uh, big amount of computer time uh, 
of the national labs in the state or DOE uh, in the INSIGHT program. Okay, and uh, I gave also a reference where you find all the details of what I'm going to, to say. Okay, let's, let's start. So, as I said, I want to begin like if I didn't know nothing about solid states and I am a quantum chemist and I know how to do configuration interaction or Monte Carlo, never mind. And uh, I want to do that for uh, a solid state and with correlation, explicit correlation. And uh, okay, so, um, so I will stick as much as possible to, I would say, to this basic quantum chemistry and just to show how, where are the essential difference. Not, not so many, that's the important point, but there are some separate things. So we start with a system which is very well defined, which is a finite system, a molecule. And in the framework of that kind of gate relation, we know that a molecule is just a few members, which essentially is a number of fixed nuclei, the charge of this uh, nuclei, the position, and the number of electrons, the total number of electrons. And usually we distinguish between alpha, beta, or up down electrons, of course. So molecule is well defined. The Hamiltonian also in our standard non-relativistic nuclei approximation is the standard uh, Coulombic potential with interaction with repulsion between electrons and attraction between electrons and nuclei. So basic stuff. So what we do as a first step if we want to do a configuration interaction? We first choose a one particle basis set. Uh, typically, this is uh, our Gaussian function, and this is what we are going to use for the solid. So this is really what we are going to use. And this uh, particle basis set is one particle basis is more is, is as a some size. Let's call it n basis, the number of this uh, uh, basis function. So what, what we do after is to construct some orthonormal uh, molecular uh, basis sets, um, uh, orbit, orbitals, which is just a combination of, of, of the uh, basis um, uh, function. And, uh, and usually we obtain that, obtain that by making an artifact calculation, or it can be a DFT calculation, or it can be some computation of natural orbitals in some correlated uh, calculation, never mind. So it's a set of orthonormal molecular orbitals. And then, as you know, we consider the, the space of wave function, which are just all possible determinants corresponding to all possible fillings of the molecular orbitals. So determinant is a, a, a basic uh, quantity of determinants. So after that, we have to calculate the matrix of the Hamiltonian. And after that, we are going to diagonalize the Hamiltonian using any method, for example, Davidson or any sophisticated power method in order to, to, to diagonalize these large matrices. So, uh, we are, in fact, essentially doing exactly this for the correlated solids, okay, with some small difference. So, what are the difference? Essentially, the difference is in the system and in the Hamiltonian. And, in fact, uh, the solid is infinite now, not like the molecule. So, we need to define what I will call a finite model system. And of course, we don't have this problem with molecules. The molecule is well-defined. The infinite solid is of course well-defined, but we cannot make the calculation on an infinite solid right, right now, directly. So we have to make it a finite model. So that is the first aspect. And a good model is what? Is a model where that's what we, we call the finite size effects. That means the difference in properties when you compute uh, with a finite model system and with the, the infinite solid uh, as, are as small as possible. And after that, we have the problem of the thermonic limit, which means to extrapolate the results to the infinity. Now, I spend a little time about a fundamental point, which was not clear at all for me when I started this problem, which is the fact that when we uh, make correlated calculation in a solid, 
we are in a situation where we, uh, in fact, we leave the standard textbook of solid state physics uh, paradigm. And uh, we're a little confused because it is not clear what we are supposed to do at the first sight. So that is essentially for people who have, uh, didn't uh, think about that before. Um, and in fact, this is very important because it will define the kind of model system we will, uh, in fact, use in this correlated calculation in solids. So what I'm saying is that when you take the electron, electron interaction explicitly in your correlated calculation, you have, in fact, a huge uh, reduction of symmetry, translational, translational symmetry, with respect to what you are used to do in solid state physics using uh, standard setting. Okay, and why that? Let me just recall uh, rapidly what you do in what we call one electron effective theories. It means independent electrons, R3 fork, Conchan, or JWU when you write down the equation at the end of the day. It's, you have some equation, one particular Miltonian, depends how you, you, you write the thing, which are invariant under the translation of individual electrons by lattice vector. So you take one electron, you move it, and your uh, equation or your Hamiltonian is, is, is doesn't change. This is uh, true, indeed, when you have no explicit interaction and attraction. And then you come out with the famous block theorem, where you say that the solution of this problem, this one particular problem, has the form of a plane wave with some modulation by a function u. And u, u which has the periodicity of the crystal, and k indicates um, label uh, is a, what we call a good quantum number, which is the label, the irreducible representation. And the domain of variation of k is, of course, the first body zone defined as, as usual. Now, when you have done that, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation essentially, and this is what is important, in the primitive cell. Essentially, it's enough. You solve this equation. And uh, for each k, small k, and see since different symmetries for different k, you solve it independently, your consham or artifact. So when you do that in standard DFT, for example, you never heard about some finite model system. You don't introduce a finite model system. You don't define a model system because, in fact, just giving the primitive cell is enough. Okay. And what does mean increasing the size of the system in this context? is just when you make your average to compute your physical property, you take more and more k points in the first brilliant zone. And in the limit where you take all the k points, continuous, uh, infinite continuous set of k points, you get the, the, the exact answer without any variety. Now, when you switch on the electron-electron interaction, the important point is now the symmetry when you move one electron is no longer valid. OK, so it's obvious because if you move one electron and let the other electron fix, because of the electron-electron repulsion, you change the potential, electron-electron potential. But the only symmetry left is the fact that you move all together the electrons with a given uh, translation. OK, so in the exact setting correlated wave function, you don't have no longer k, small k, as good, good quantum numbers. Okay, so that is some, um, so this justify the fact that now in the case of correlated calculation, and in contrast with what we are used with DFT or r calculation, we need to define some finite model in order to uh, look at the effect of the electron-electron correlation. You cannot stick to the primitive cell. Okay, so what we do, it's natural, we will introduce a supercell which consists in uh, uh, introduce just taking a few primitive cells. So here I would call L1, L2, L3, the number of primitive cells in each direction I take, so that at the end you have L1 times L2 times L3 primitive cell in your supercell. And you have to see now the supercell as just a big molecule, okay, for the moment. But of course, uh, you want to reduce the finite size effect. So what you said, okay, so what I'm going to do is I need to find, to have the effect also of the infinite other atoms outside. And you introduce an artificial super lattice, it's really artificial, 
where could you obtain by periodizing the sweet asset? So now you introduce new elementary superlative vectors. Now there are superlatives and lattice, which are essentially uh, the product of H A one A two with the number of sweet asset. And you have now a superlative, so I call it uh, T uh, T S S for superlative. Okay. And oh, just one in here. I want this uh, you got to be sure that I don't forget. Be careful because in standard DFT calculation and one electron series, we use super lattice and uh, super cells. And in fact, usually we use it because in presence of impurities, you say, okay, one impurity breaks the transactional symmetry. So I take a, a super cell and I periodize the impurity in order to recover some uh, transactional symmetry. So this is exactly what we do here, but for a completely different purpose, we have no impurity, but we have an electron-electron interaction, which requires to have this supercell, okay? So now, what is the problem we have to solve? Uh, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation using any of your method, Kepler cluster, CI, QMC, SAS SCF, never mind, for a supercell, L1, L2, L3. And you have to realize that this is just a molecule for the moment, just a big molecule. And uh, you have a number of electrons, which is finite, which is the number of electrons of each primitive cell times the number of primitive cells. So you have a number of nuclei also, which is a product of the number of primitive cells point the number of nuclei unit. And you have an Hamiltonian. You can take the standard Hamiltonian. Yeah, there is no, no problem with that, except that you say, okay, I want to see if I can do something about the external electrons and the nuclei, I forgot. And what you do is the standard things, which consists to say, okay, my electrons and nuclei of my big molecule will interact with their periodic replica in the other cell, supercell. Okay, so now you are, you are led to a standard Hamiltonian where you have the kinetic energy. Everything is the same except that you take electron nuclei interaction, which sum up the interaction of your electrons with all the nuclei, uh, which are translated by a super lattice uh, vector. Exactly the same for electron nuclei and electron electron. Okay, so now we are all done. We can do the calculation. You have all the elements. You make your CI calculation. You should take your basic set. You choose your big molecule. And this big molecule is a finite molecule like we have in quantum chemistry, except that the potential has a slightly changed. But this is just, <clears throat> just a change of a formula which depends only on the position of electrons. And of course, we have only electrons in the supercell in the big molecule. So you have to realize that you are really in the standard phase mode of quantum chemistry. <coughs> but there is something new here which is in fact very interesting and usually not presented in textbooks, is the fact that when you do that, you can also define the block theorem. That what I call, uh, this is my wording, uh, it's not official, the many body block theorem, which says that, of course, you have a translational symmetry of the super lattice and all eigen function, eigen states, and I mean eigen state, n particle eigen state, not one electron eigen states, have also, uh, uh, a block theorem, which means that uh, the, the, the form is exponential a plane way for all electrons and a periodic uh, part, modulation map, a periodic part, and you have exactly the same a, a, <coughs> a wave vector, which I call it, <coughs> sorry, I call it big K, and you have a brilliant zone, but now it's a brilliant zone of the super lattice, super lattice, which is uh, it means that instead of having pi over AA, you have pi over LAA, and you have one big K, and you can make calculate you make calculation with a fixed K. And the interesting point, which will be very useful in the following, is to see that this K, in fact, if you make the translation of one elect of one uh, electron by uh, uh, <coughs> by a super lattice vector. Of course, you take, because of this many body block theorem, you get the exponential e big K T S factor, which means that the big K defines the type of boundary condition at the supercell. 
Of course, the supercell is, super, is, is completely artificial choice, and this is completely artificial uh, choice of boundary condition is possible. You have no no reason to take k equals zero or k anything. So in the case where k big k equals zero, you have periodic boundary condition. Where k is a p pi over l, you have anti-periodic, and you have a general boundary condition. You have a complex rate vector. So, like in the case of small k in primitive cell in DFT, we have here big k in the supercell solving the Schrod Medibody Schrodinger equation independently for each k. And this is quite important because uh, you are going to compute energies, etc., for different big k in a completely independent way. And the good idea, of course, is to make twisted boundary, what we call twisted boundary averaging, which means that you are going to take a certain number of value of big K in his first brilliant zone of the super lattice and average your, re uh, sorry, and average your results here. Just a standard average because it's uh, completely independent. And of course, this is very effective in fact in, um, in reducing the finite size error. Why? Because we know that when we choose a, a given set of periodic of boundary condition, you have molecular orbitals, which will depend on the boundary condition, and you have a feeling, and you know that some, some big effect from the feeling depends on where you stop. So when you do that for different uh, boundary condition, all these things mix up. And this one body kind of effects linked to the uh, feeling of these one body molecular orbitals mix up uh, and, and interfere in a way that it keeps a, a big amount of. Uh, so so uh, we use this in our actual calculation. It's an important aspect. So uh, rapidly, just uh, an important technical point, but uh, OK. Uh, I have to say because I want my uh, quantum chemist be able to do the calculation, so I just to give all the detail. Of course, uh, in the sum I showed uh, over the supercell of the Coulombic interaction, you know that the sum of one over R will diverge. So this technical point is important, and we know that these sums are mathematically ill-conditioned. So I, 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 I have no time to give some. Uh, some detail about that, but it's a very interesting matter, and um, which is related to distribution theory, etc. So uh, I have no time, really. But it's interesting to see that it is possible to replace this infinite sum, divergent sum, by some finite sum, and we take uh, two regimes. And at the end of the day, really sorry for the for that aspect, but your uh, Coulombic potential becomes damped in space and damped in K space. Here K will be, a, uh, okay, never mind. And this is uh, very interesting because I don't give detail, but at the end, you uh, infinite sum are replaced by sum of one over R in the standard way, uh, modulated by Gaussian function, and eventually Fourier transform when you go in the K space. And at the end of the day, as a one and two electrons integrals, because you have Gaussian, uh, can be managed in order to be in a standard framework of uh, Gaussian integrals in, in quantum chemistry. And of course, Fourier transform is easy in, in presence of Coulombic terms. So uh, from a technical point of view, this is one part you have to manage, but it's uh, nothing very uh, terrible, okay? So uh, another notion is a molecular basis set. I said, I have a big molecule. I'm serving a big molecule. So I have a molecular basis set. You can do the calculation uh, like that with your Gaussian function, localized Gaussian basis set. And of course, what you're, when you are going to, to, to do the molecular basis set calculation, making, for example, R3 for DFT, now we are going to have this, uh, new, this high symmetry where one electron can be moved, so the standard uh, scheme, and your molecular orbitals will be classified according to K. So if you make the calculation, you just look at your molecular orbitals, and you will see just by practice that effectively they have uh, this symmetry. So of course, a good idea is we know that, so it's to symmetrize the Gaussian basis set. Now, using the first brain zone of the lattice system uh, from the start, 
So essentially, it's taking some linear combination of the Gaussian in order to block diagonalize our two electrons and one electron integral from the very start, of course. Okay, um, so let's summarize. Uh, what is really new for solids if you want to make a correlated calculation with standard uh, quantum chemistry stuff? I would say the first thing is this general boundary condition. And as I said, it is really an important part because in practice, when we do the, the realistic calculation, it's really important to kill this uh, finite size effect in the best way. So we will use it. So in that case, uh, because of this uh, complex phase factor, all the things now become complex valued. So you have to extend your quantum chemistry code to the case of complex molecular orbitals, Hermitian Hamiltonian with complex uh, matrix elements, etc. And you have to diagonal that. So everything is fine, except that you have to deal with this uh, stupid technical aspect. And in many papers, some recent papers, people are just very lazy. So what they do is they say, okay, I will compute only k equals zero, which is called a gamma point in the brilliant zone of the super lattice, so super gamma point, if you want, it, even if it's uh, the, the correct, uh, okay, never. And everything can be real in that case by taking, uh, uh, because it is symmetric in the case space and okay, you take the real part and uh, it works. That, that if you are lazy. But uh, the second thing is just that you have to modify your subroutine calculating the one and two electron integrals with this modified one and two body potential, which are just standard manipulation. That's not a great deal. And after that, as I said, <clears throat> instead of making one calculation like we do for a molecule, you have to make uh, a number of uh, calculation for your big molecule in the supercell for different K and of course, you have to look at the thermal limit limit, which means repeat the calculation for supercell of increasing size and extrapolate. So it's uh, not uh, finally not very, very different. Okay, so uh, now uh, what we are going to do is to just to detail very rapidly what uh, technically what uh, are the methods we use. So in order to have a minimal number of uh, determinants, uh, we use selected configuration interaction to make the CI calculation. You probably know that there is a huge recent resurgence of selected configuration uh, method, and uh, we call it selected CI. So, and there are many, many variants which are published in these last year. Uh, let's say about the semi uh, semi stochastic feedback CI, adapted CI, full CI PMC, and new, we are using CIPC, which is an old method, but which is very. Uh, in fact, all these methods are. If they are well implemented, they are more or less equivalent. Uh, okay, so the main point of that kind of method is that to, to kn we know that only a teeny fraction of the determinants plays a role in the full CI wave function. We know that. Uh, the full CI, we, people are talking about the exponential role, etc. cetera, but, but really, uh, if you are able to extract the important determinant in a clever way, I mean, your energy and properties will converge quite rapidly without having to, to deal with the full uh, CI space. And what do selected configuration interaction is just, you start with some reasonable wave function, for example, Archie Fock determinant, and you select in an iterative way, what are the most important determinants using a perturbative criterion. It means that you take uh, psi zero as a R3 fork, you look at the connection by H, what are the deter single and double deter uh, excited determinants which are the more, more important in the sense of the contribution to the wave function, and you accept a certain number of these determinants and you iterate, it's quite easy. So just, I, 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 I like to show this because we see that it's non, uh, uh, this is for the oxygen atom, so a simple system, so here, the total number of um, determinants we get in a selected CI calculation. And you see that that is a number of double, single, triple, quadruple, uh, quintuple, sextuple as a function. So when you, are, you see that rapidly, you can have more quadruple than triple, more. So you see it's not at all, I mean, to do all the double, then all the triple, then all the quadruple is really not the best thing to do. Really, you have lots of sextuple, which are more important than double or 
I mean, so the structure of the full CI wave functions is not really well reproduced by using a priori selection of uh, uh, subspace of the full CI space for uh, according to the class of excitation. So really that is the kind of idea which makes it uh, uh, efficient. Okay, we use a CIPC algorithm, which is a particular set of selected CI. Uh, I won't uh, detail this uh, view graph, just to say that it is a very old ID. Uh, the first paper we found is in uh, 69, where a basic idea has been introduced by Witten et Meyer. Then you have the, the, the wonderful work by Malrieu and collaborators in 673, which gave the name of CIPC. And in short, as I said, you add iteratively determinants in the wave function by looking here, it's the energy contribution of the potentially new determinants and you add uh, and, and you iterate this kind of things. I have no time to really detail that. So uh, an interesting point is you can compute the second order perturbative correction and it gives you extremely efficient in order to correct the energy of your reference wave function. Uh, okay, uh, here is just one illustration of how much can be uh, efficient. Here is the titanium atom, uh, all electron calculation with uh, double, triple, and quadruple zeta. And you see the curve as a function for number of determinants here the, and to the 10 million determinants. And you see that the energy here in blue converge to the full CI limit here, for example, you have 10 to the 18 determinants, and in, with 10 to the 7, with some accuracy, you can converge to the full CI limit. It is extremely efficient, and it's extremely impressive how less, how small number of determinants is needed to reach with the, the chemical accuracy the uh, full CI energy. So that has kind of ID. Just mention that all these things have been uh, developed in uh, the so-called quantum package, which is a very nice code developed uh, from scratch uh, by essentially Anthony Semama and after that many collaborators. Now it's developed in several groups and it's used in, a, it's a really a very good uh, thing. And I'm proud of Anthony and uh, the, all the people we work on that. And the main working group right now is Toulouse, Paris, Paris with Julien, uh, Manuel Giner, uh, Peter Reinhardt, etc., and also Argonne Laboratory, uh, where uh, they, they, they program all these uh, solid state stuff. Okay, and you can download it. So, um, so that's it for the, the how to, to make a, 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 a CI calculation for a correlated so, solid. Now, Quantum Monte Carlo. Why Quantum Monte Carlo? Because we know that it gives really excellent results in solid state physics for a number of applications. It's, uh, it's eventually expensive, but uh, you, have, uh, you can get some uh, inf interesting in in information. The problem is that uh, you have one fundamental approximation, which is called the fixed node approximation. We will see that in a, in a few minutes. And the, in fact, the system is very, the results are very dependent of the, I would say, nature of the nodes. Uh, we call, uh, if you take nodes of um, Concham or Archifog determinants, which we call here single reference nodes, you get a very good result for, for systems which are essentially dominated by a single reference uh, wave function. And, uh, and uh, this is not, this, we could have expected something else. In fact, uh, nodes are just the place where the wave function is small. It's not the most important part of the wave function, but experience shows clearly that if uh, you don't have the correct physics in the wave function, uh, you have uh, non-physical nodes. So it was a kind of, uh, the nodes encoded some of the important uh, physical stuff. So we could have imagined that you, you would have good results with uh, not so good nodes, but they may not the case. So here, our, 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 to, be, to be short, our proposal is to use the nodes of large selected configuration wave function in QMC in order to be able to make some uh, really difficult system like uh, strongly correlated system. Okay, uh, just in one view graph, we are doing a fixed node uh, DMC uh, calculation. And, um, and it's a very easy things to do. 
And the main point is to choose a tri-way function. You define the population of workers, which are just copy of your electrons uh, to, be, to be brief. Uh, you generate stochastic trajectory for the workers. This is very easy to do. And the basic uh, quantity is a drift vector, which is a gradient of psi t over psi t. This is a quantity which allows us to push the electron where they have to do. And after there is a branching step where you create or destroy workers according to the local energy, the lower the local energy, which is defined as H, H psi t over psi t is, the lower it is, the better, the, the more we, we branch and we, we, we copy these uh, workers. And after that, it's just average. Okay, sorry for the, for the very rapid uh, presentation, but what we have just to recall is that there is only one fundamental error. There are other errors, but we can control them basically. But uh, the fixed node error, why we have a fixed node error? Because as I showed you, the drift, which is responsible for, the, for a part of the move of the electrons is gradient of psi t of psi t. And when psi t goes to zero, the, the, the nodes of the wave function are like infinity repulsive barriers and your workers remain trapped within the nodal, surface, the nodal volumes, the volumes of the configuration, uh, configuration space cut by the nodes of, of psi t, and they remain forever trapped in this volume. So in fact, what you do, you have an exact method or solution of the Schrodinger equation, except that you add, uh, you solve it by, with the constraint that the solution uh, vanish where, whenever psi t, the tri-wave function vanish. Your trial wave function is approximate. Your nodes are then approximate, and you get so uh, biased uh, uh, energy or other properties, which is called the fixed node energy with this fixed node error. And of course, there is no such a friend lunch. We uh, don't know where the nodes are, and the uh, uh, things we can do, uh, we are able to do, is just essentially take a different trial wave function and look at uh, the improvement uh, related to the, to the nodes. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me just finish this first part by two few graphs. The first one is application to realistic solid. Is it possible? Question, should a QNC CI approach be considered as realistic for solids? It is not clear because, of course, uh, we know that CI calculation, large CI calculation, are very expensive for big molecules. And we are taking big molecules here, large supercells. QNC calculation using a large number of determinants are also very expensive. So, and, at, and plus, we have to compute the um, thermodynamic limit. It means that we have to take more bigger and bigger big molecules. And clearly, Maybe it's completely unrealistic. And uh, so the answer to this question is, uh, I don't know. I mean, we tried it and uh, we find some interesting results, give some interesting insight. And we were able for the carbon diamond to find, I would say almost the exact cohesive energy in the thermonic limit, uh, but uh, clearly it, it, it's really a, a, a challenge. Okay, so what I can say is here is we use all possible means to uh, to be able to make the calculation real. So it means uh, to defer as much as possible the exponential wall of CI, as we say. So we made selected CI. I won't have time to detail, but we have used uh, reduced as to space. We have looked at, uh, so it's not a full CI, it's a CI, selected CI in a finite number of uh, orbitals, molecular orbitals. And uh, of course, we have looked at the impact of that on the etc. etc. We have a huge reduction of the cost of QMC using efficient and clever algorithms, not by me, but mostly by Anthony, uh, for treating very large number of determinants, because here we are talking about millions of determinants. And uh, the reduction of final size effect, it's very important in order to look at the thermodynamic limit. So, a systematic use of twisted boundary averaging with a very large number of boundary conditions. In addition, we have a massive parallelism, which is a nice place, a nice thing to do in uh, QNC. And uh, I must say a very large amount of CPU time, which is only possible because we have this national lab uh, DOE uh, computer, which allows to make uh, quite large calculations. But at the end of the day, uh, some, uh, okay. So that, that is the first part. So 
it's 38 minutes, so maybe there are some uh, some questions. I don't know. Francesco, can you look at the questions? If there are. Well, we can definitely ask. There is Andreas already raising his hand. So, Andreas, okay. please. Fine. Super. Andreas. Well, well I, I don't have, I can wait. If uh, Michel prefers to continue, I can ask. I can wait. Michel? It, it, it depends on the time I have because uh, uh, I would need something like 15 minutes. Would be okay, uh, Francesco? Well, th then I skip. I skip. No, it I can... think I think uh, if there are no, it questions, can... uh, questions of I wait. the first part, I wait. why not? No, 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 it's not smart. Nothing okay, smart. Okay, okay. Let's, okay. Let, let's do Q and we'll see after. Right? Yes, okay. So, so as I said, uh, our first application in order to validate the method or not is a cardboard diamond, which, uh, which is a classical test case in computational solid state physics and many methods, all the methods have been checked on this uh, system. And what we have tried is to calculate the cohesive energy of carbon diamond, okay? Which is well known from an experimental uh, way. And uh, clearly all people will see right now that it is not a strongly correlated uh, system. It's uh, what we call a weakly correlated. So single reference node. People have done this DNC calculation and other type of test calculation. In Quantum Monte Carlo for solid, essentially people use either the six node uh, DNC uh, method I, I described as rapidly or the auxiliary field Quantum Monte Carlo, which is another way of doing this calculation, but okay. So using single reference node, you essentially do the job and you essentially recover uh, the correct uh, experimental a cohesive energy in a thermonic limit. So we will here perfectly recover the experimental cohesive energy, but we must say that uh, multi-reference effects are weak. We are now working on strongly correlated system. We have some results, but as I said, it's too preliminary. I don't want to, 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 uh, to give stupid uh, results, uh, which could be changed uh, after a while. So here it's the first test and implementation, okay? So the carbon diamond, what is a carbon diamond? It's a fast centered cubic uh, crystal structure system, you know that. And in practice, you're in your primitive cell, you have two carbon atoms, two unequivalent carbon atoms. It means that if you apply all the translation of elementary lattice vector to these two carbon atoms, you are able to generate the position of all the atoms of the system. So the primitive cell have two carbon atoms and we use pseudo potential. So it means that we have eight, eight electrons, two times four electrons in each uh, uh, primitive cell. Okay, so we have done this extensive CI and DNC calculation for the, I would say the following systems. The first one is a primitive cell. So it makes eight electrons. We did the single determinant and multi-determinant DNC, of course. And we went up to four by four by four, which means 256 electrons. Okay, so we did 64, 108, and, uh, and we made in each case, single determinant and multi-determinant DNC, except for the largest case where you, we made only single determinant DNC for computational reasons. And we made a number of twists, for example, for the two by two by two, we have 216 twists, means 216 points, big K points in the brisen zone of the super lattice. Okay, and typically the size of our CI expansion is between 600,000 and 1 million to 100,000 or maybe even more, I think. We used, uh, uh, as it is usual in QMC, an optimized Jastro factor in order to reduce the fluctuation. But we don't re-optimize the CI part because we want to work with nodes of the uh, CI wave function and of course, we can lower the energy by re-optimizing the CI path, but our idea is to have some clear and description. And when you improve uh, 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 and to have a control on, on the node, not linked to some non-linear optimization, but this is a matter uh, I can't spend too much time discussing on that. Okay. Um, okay, so I must say that uh, uh, to our best of our knowledge, no, no one made some uh, real, uh, uh, QMC calculate, DNC calculation with lots of determinants in solid states. Basically, it's a single determinant DFT calculation up to now, or a few determinants, but not such a huge number. So the nodes are really changing the, in, in, with respect to the single determinant nodes. So 
uh, let's just call, uh, I'll show you just the, the uh, CIPC, CIPC results for the, here as an illustration for the smallest supercell, which is a primitive cell. And uh, here on the axis, you have the number of determinants, we get to uh, more than 1 million, the total energy, and uh, the curves give you, uh, on the top, it's a variational curve, which means that this is your energy when you add, you select determinants, and here we used uh, either artifoc or B3 leap uh, orbitals, just in order to show that uh, when we are, when we reach when we reach a full CI limit, the results are independent on the choice of these uh, of these orbitals, of course. So you have on the top the variational energy, so you see it converge with some accuracy to the full CI, and on the on the bottom it's uh, when you add the second order perturbative. And we have developed some efficient scheme to calculate these uh, quite expensive uh, quantities. And uh, in fact, we use the stochastic scheme also to compute this. And, uh, and, and you see that the convergence is much rapid and you get. Uh, so we have done this CC calculation with millions of determinants for all the system I showed uh, before. Now it's interesting to compare with what people do. And here I just, uh, we made uh, an, uh, quite a number of, uh, of, of uh, of, of comparison and studies, and I, I just show you some uh, uh, some of the main results here. I don't want to spend too much time to all these numbers, but here it's interesting because we have looked. Uh, this is a single determinant the DMC. So you make um, DMC with uh, 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 DFT nodes, and uh, you change uh, the type of orbital. So this is the result for the LDA orbitals. Orbitals from the PBE, P3 leap, and the Archifoc uh, uh, orbitals. And you change also the basis set. So here it's a double zeta basis set. Here it's a triple zeta basis set. And here on the bottom, we made the calculation uh, using DFT and uh, with plane wave and uh, with a huge number of plane waves and the plane wave cutoff and at the LDA level. And you see that we get uh, the same, the same. Uh, uh, energy here, and you see that uh, the other are not so far. So it means that, uh, let's say, at the triple zeta level, we should have some uh, reasonable uh, basis set. This is certainly the most uh, interesting uh, view graph here is uh, about the impact uh, of the node, because this is really the, the, main, the main aspect here. Here, you showed the DMC total energy, and the red point here, are the uh, fixed node energy you get with a single reference node using LDA, PBA, etc. So it's relatively constant and homogeneous. And here is uh, the fixed node energy you gain when you start from artifoc and you begin to select more and more determinants, the multi determinants. And, and, and this means, okay, here it's a uh, it's a threshold, but let's say that here you have one more than one million determinants, and here you have uh, less and less, uh, more and more determinants up to uh, one million. Uh, the threshold here, when it's zero, it means that you have a CPC calculation with one million determinants, not the threshold with respect to the full CI, it's with respect to the last CPC point. So it's, it's okay. So you see that you have a huge gain of energy. And uh, it's, uh, it's, really, um, it's really clear that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, using this multi configuration is, is uh, it plays a role. Okay, so here I, I won't uh, to detail too much, but you have two curves here because this is a this is a, an active space we used just to show that uh, the, the, the 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 sensitivity was not so 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 large. But uh, I skip these uh, these details. Okay, so now I, I will here hand uh, and because of the, of the time and. Uh, uh, to the final results, I would say, with this uh, uh, view graph, uh, synthesize all the calculation we, we did, uh, and uh, the way we look at the thermodynamic limit. So here, one over n is one over the size of the system, so the number of supercells, essentially, one over the number of supercells, essentially, and you have results, DMC results, with this uh, uh, CI wave function, either at the gamma point, so in, in red, uh, in uh, not broken, uh, let me see, not broken curve, red and black, 
is at a gamma point. It means that I use only k, big k equals zero, the periodic boundary condition, okay? And uh, this is red is in a single determinant and uh, broke and black, uh, solid black, uh, no, uh, solid black is a multi-determinant, which is here, okay? You see that uh, finite size effect are quite strong. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, okay. And if now you, you, you twist average, uh, which is uh, TA here, single and double, you see that uh, the, the final size effect are much smaller than using only uh, gamma point and no twist uh, average. And the nice thing is you can extrapolate in both gates and uh, you see that you are able, in fact, uh, you are able to converge to the same same limit. In fact, what we do is we we impose in the fit to have an exact the same limit because in theory, uh, as uh, when n goes to infinity, the boundary condition doesn't count anymore. In fact, if you look at the definition of the uh, brilliant zone of the super lattice, when l goes to zero, the brilliant zone shrink to zero you only left with one point, with a gamma point, and of course, all the results are independent on the, on the K point uh, we use. So, and, uh, and, uh, and you see the, 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 uh, the big contribution of, of, the, uh, of the nodes to the, to the total energy. And when you remove this in a coherent way with the atomic energies of carbon, you get, uh, essentially, you get the exact uh, uh, experimental value for the, the cohesive uh, energy. And I might just say that uh, uh, it's nice to see that kind of behavior. It's nice to see the impact of nodes. It's nice to see the effect of twist averaging. But clearly, uh, uh, these are quite expensive calculation. I have to say that. Uh, uh, we are talking here about a million and millions of uh, CPU time and so uh, uh, we are uh, we are still far from being uh, a general tool for for making solid state calculation but uh, uh, we are doing now with uh, um, strong equilibrium system uh, transition metal uh, oxides that of course we cannot do the you cannot do the thermodynamic limit there are many things we can do but what we want to see is a trend and uh, compare with standard uh, method to see uh, how the things are changing uh, when you put these uh, these uh, multi-reference effects in in a dot. Okay, I think I will finish here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Michel, um, and thank you especially for guiding us uh, pedagogically to the to the result rather than okay. showing only that. Uh, I particularly appreciate it. Um, so there are certainly questions. Um, I would first ask uh, uh, Andreas because you already you already sort of booked the question, and then Antoine. Maybe I leave others first because I have a few questions, and maybe other people want to leave or so. So I can wait for the last position. <laughs> so okay, as you wish, again. Antoine. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was uh, very nice. Um, so my question is about the convergence that you show here. So probably the convergence is pretty slow with n, at least theoretically. But um, so people in solid state do like correction schemes for defects and things like that. Electronic correction schemes. Is that can that be used here, or is it a different problem? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Of course. Uh, you're right. I mean, uh, we are looking at that kind of things also. I mean, clearly here, uh, the extrapolation has no no theoretical uh, uh, justification. I mean, it just we just uh, we have three points, four points. We see that we can extrapolate. That's it. I mean, but uh, of course, what we can do is to, for example, take. Uh, uh, try to, to, to put, as the people do, you, you, you make a calculation with a, a theory which is a lower level, which, for example, would be uh, here with a single reference nodes or something like that. And after 
to, to, to make the difference in order to make uh, use extrapolation, which is much more easy to do with uh, single determinant nodes and try to enhance uh, and, 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 and our, our extrapolation. But these things are now, we have, didn't elaborate too much on that for the moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Bernard. Hello, do you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, hello, Michel. Thank you for this presentation. Yeah. Uh, I have just a simple question on um, correlated systems, strongly correlated systems such as uh, transition metal oxide, uh, lanthanides, uh, in which static correlation is important. Do you expect additional difficulties, or it is, or is it just a problem of computational cost? Uh, in, in fact, what, what we are doing, I mean, using, uh, I mean, within quantum package, and, uh, we can. Uh, um, we can not easily, but we can compute excited states. And in this uh, transition metal system, I mean, the most important thing is to to look at the gap. And uh, and uh, and so we uh, what we uh, what we do is essentially look at uh, ex excitation electronic excitation energy and to vary the type of transition metal. And we we care about the finite size effect. We just try to look at the, the trend. But if you want to make a, a more accurate, I mean, we, 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 I mean, we, not, we do not search the, the accuracy we have here. Clearly, it would be a question of computer time, as you say. I mean, okay. so, so the idea is to explore uh, some uh, differential uh, trends between different systems to see how the gap evaluate and, and how the nodes change the evolution because people are doing calculation, for example, with uh, single determinant nodes, and that's it. And usually, the nodes are optimized using, uh, for example, uh, uh, they add a Hubbard term, a U term, like uh, people do in DFT. And you can try to optimize the U in order to have the best node because you know there is a variation of principle in the node. So people play a lot all around that. And here we have a way of constructing multi-reference nodes. Of course, it will not be a million of million of determinants, but we can uh, build quite a consistent uh, uh, multi-reference wave function and see if it goes in the correct direction and if uh, what about uh, the correction people try to do, etc. So it's more will be more semi-quantitative uh, analysis than uh, a completely quantitative. Yeah, it would be too expensive for the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, then uh, Eric, please. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, Michel. Hello, everybody. Thanks for your talk. Oops, sorry. Oops. Okay, sorry. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a technical question about uh, uh, DMC because, uh, as you mentioned, when you take several K points uh, in your supercell, your uh, wave functions uh, must be complex. Yeah. And so, what, what does that change for uh, for uh, the DMC uh, calculation? Let me see. Uh, in fact, um, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. I must say that uh, okay, uh, it changed. I mean, the, the, the phase factor. I mean, the big there is a phase factor. We don't care about that. The point is, you have the molecular orbitals are. Um, complex now and uh, the determinant uh, let me see uh, no I have no pre I think we we do the uh, no I, I can't answer you your question because uh, I didn't do the calculation but I think the people they, they just and we'll just take the gradient and uh, Nothing new. No, no, it's a good question. I, I, no, I, I, yeah, yeah, we can discuss in Toulouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in January, when yeah, I, yeah. okay, thanks. But if I might uh, consider just a simple point, o already the simple um, call to all subroutines, no, 
that yeah. you have to to consider either for the matrix element with the determinants or with mm. the so all these have to change considering uh, maybe yeah. Hermitian, but yeah. but now they are not uh, they are not uh, real matrices. No, all the yeah. calls that have to change in some way. Yes. They have to be interfaced in some yes. way. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's uh, it uh, was uh, one of the most uh, important time that uh, Kevin the the Kevin Gasperich did that. Uh, it's a postdoc in Argonne, and it takes quite a uh, time to to do that. Yes, but. Uh, um, these people are using uh, DMC and um, twist averaging. Have always have already worked in uh, in this uh, in this uh, complex uh, situation. So uh, it's work, but it's uh, not from a fundamental point of view a problem. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so next uh, is uh, Patrick, please. Yeah. First, uh, thank you, Michel, for this uh, very instructive talk. Uh, I have uh, also a question that can be qualified as uh, technical. Uh, you, you mentioned that um, you regularize your one of our series uh, for the potential. Yeah. So I would like to ask uh, how sensitive are your results to the uh, regularization uh, parameters? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I actually don't know because you know it's a standard uh, stuff in solid state physics. Uh, so we have just taken the formula and we didn't have make analysis. But I think that these things. I mean, people here are much more expert than that than me. I'm sure that uh, it has been a lot of studied in standard uh, solid state physics. The, 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 the sensibility to the representation with eval technique. But we didn't, you know, I mean, these calculations are very, very uh, expensive. So we didn't play with changing things to see the sensitivity. But uh, as far as I understand, you maybe people here can answer. It's, uh, it's not too much a problem, no? It, as soon, you know, you have uh, this sigma uh, quantity, which is, uh, which makes a distinction between uh, a short range and large, uh, short distance and large distance uh, regime in this eval technique and i think it's not so sensitive once you have the a, 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 a correct uh, i mean some given uh, value but I, I cannot elaborate on that i have no experience at all on that but people here maybe francesco you have an idea about that or or no um actually I, i'm not particularly sure i have to say that for uh, all the situation in which the equal sum have to be done in a, just a simple periodic situation with a, with a primitive cell mm. this is a sort of standard taken into account into into the dft codes and uh, i've never particularly cared about it to be honest yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something which is, uh, I think, has been more or less stabilized in the community, and people now are not. Yeah, it's uh, it's not something in... that I have to pay attention to. Yeah. For example, looking at my parameters, input parameters. Yeah. So, there might there might be more indeed than that, but yeah. I wouldn't say that it's particularly yeah. Uh, yeah. crucial this point. But it's only for the nuclei, right? Uh, the, no, the... No, no. for the electron electron too. Oh, okay. I gave a general, I showed just a general uh, formula for charge, interaction between charge, and it's a general problem, and uh, it, can, it is between nuclear charge and electron, and electron, electron. Both are infinite summation of one over R. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, well, before uh, leaving the hand to Andreas, and not because I want to leave, but I have a small question. Uh, at a certain moment, you show a picture in which uh, there is the, uh, the curve of the total energy that is going down when you increase more and more with the number of determinants, and you call it this, in fact, uh, variational. And then there is another curve, which I didn't uh, catch when you explain it, that is increasing with the number, uh, this one, exactly. Can you say again, what is the, 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 the dashed lines, why they are increasing the total energy with the, when you increase the number of determinants? In fact, this is a second order uh, correction to the variational energy. So 
technically it's what we call a Epstein Nesbet um, correction because you take a H0, you take essentially a diagonal matrix with the um, with a wave function, uh, reference wave function from which you compute the variational energy and the diagonal are the uh, determinants of uh, reference determinants. So uh, all the excited determinants. So uh, it is a second order perturbation. Uh, so it's negative, systematically negative. So it corrects the, the energy in that, in that, uh, that way. That's because that's a second order. And at the beginning, you can have some, of course, some, uh, some, uh, some wingold, but uh, technically it's always that way because, because it's a second order. Okay, okay, thank you. The, 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 there was no reason for that to be variational, of course. No, 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 of course. Fact, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Andreas, please. Thank you. So, um, well, I will not repeat how well. Thank you for the nice talk. So, well, uh, I will start with a comment. Um, Cohn in the Nobel Prize lecture, he said, why DFT is needed and wave functions will not work for solids. And what he meant was essentially your slide where it shows the degree of excitation that appears like that and you cannot separate by this thing. And I think he would have liked this, your Plot here. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I, mean, I mean it's a it's a plot we we, we got. Uh, I I did for a paper in a Canadian journal. It was a mem not memory, but it was for you know it was a Denis Salahub uh, anniversary for I don't remember. What. And and when I, I, we showed that plot, I mean many people were very excited by this plot. I mean, uh, so, oh, Denise said, oh, it's incredible. Huh? We should show that to everybody, etc." I mean, it's, it's, it, in fact, uh, people know that. But, yes. Uh, uh, but it's uh, quite clear that uh, uh, it's really, uh, uh, okay. But I must say, uh, to be honest, when you increase uh, the size of the system, uh, it becomes less, uh, less like that. I mean, dub uh, quadruple, double, and I mean, the, I mean, the, the it becomes to be more uh, important, and but here for for reasonable system size, I mean, it's it's really fascinating to see how it works. <clears throat> oh. Well, I don't know. Just maybe you have to go further on the right. You see here when you go to the right, they, they start coming up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but there is another uh, thing that uh, people look uh, in order of what they did for the uniform electron gas, they uh, took a couple clusters mm -hmm. and also for solids. So do, do you have comparison with couple clusters? Because I have seen that people from Quantum Monte Carlo were complex. They said, oh, the golden uh, standard is a um, couple CCSD parenthesis T. Yeah, and I they mean... were, they say, that's why Quantum Monte Carlo is good. And when I heard him say it, I immediately stood up and said, um, stop speaking nonsense. But now you have this uh, much more solid calculation. I, I, I don't know, but, but you're right. I mean, uh, I, I, I was right, rapid at the beginning, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in the recent years, there's all this work by uh, the group of uh, Gamet Chan, for example, and other people, where they made this CC uh, triple cluster calculation for a solid state. I mean, and uh, the results are, are, are okay. Uh, I mean, they are comparable to what we get, except that, of course, it's a problem of multi-reference uh, effects. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, we see on our computation on, uh, on uh, transition metal oxide that the node change a lot due to the multi-reference aspect of the wave function. I don't know how, I mean, uh, I don't know how the cluster will, uh, recover these kind of things uh, I mean, uh, and, you know. but by definition at a certain point for multi-references it will fail yeah, by definition yeah. by construction so we know yeah, from the, the are supposed to, to finish yes, the, we, the work we, the multi -reference. no no yes but, but multi-reference should work and uh, multi where it's multi so from the association of the nitrogen molecule we know that mm -hmm. cluster fails yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is uh, I don't want to be I mean uh, Okay, <laughs> well, the, <laughs> oh, I think it's much, it's more solid. Uh, but I have some, um, a technical question. 
I don't know if I should ask now or another time or I mean, maybe, still ask. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah um, I have yeah. this, this the way you do this uh, termination. Uh, I have now this physical image that if you cut off, there are these dangling bones. Mm -hmm. So how do you treat this effect? I mean, uh, I mean. No, when people take a molecule, they want, want to make some cluster, typical cluster for a yeah. big molecule or so, they say they terminate with something and you don't terminate it. You have you have something like periodic boundary conditions that yeah. you put in. Yeah. But uh, do, do, you, do, do you see an effect on the way, because in fact, the kinetic energy, you put it on the Coulomb potential, but you don't take is effect into account um, direct? I don't see how it comes in. That's I let's mean, put it like this. I didn't understand. I don't say it's not there, but I didn't see how you treat the surfaces. I mean, so I have no enough experience uh, in that because you know, I mean, I just but but the point is, I'm expected that there are no dangling bonds in that. Yes, sense. if you put periodic boundary condition, in principle, it should not be there. You should not, yes. And uh, so, uh, I mean, so no, let us be say it like surface effects, you know, this is a phase. Yeah. And the surface effects, if they are affected by this, by not continuing, not taking it into account, the kinetic energy somehow, yes. is, are the periodic boundary conditions enough or know how, how this is? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But I expect that by, I mean, uh, that twist uh, averaging is, uh, is, is nice in that respect too, because uh, that will uh, wash up a little this kind of aspect. But I, 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 I don't see dangling bonds here. And uh, okay. No, is this effect the twist uh, averaging? So that was my say. Let us put it the last question. Um, is, oh, is there are many ways of, ways of doing an averaging? Yeah. Does it affect the result? Yes, you're right. I mean, we can we can any weight we want. I mean, uh, I can take weight, uh, some of the weight equal one, and I can make that kind of average with arbitrary weight. I mean, we can do, as you said, I mean, the point is that uh, when we take large supercell, as you know, I mean, all this energy for different k-points would be the same, so it will be independent on that. But uh, just, I, I think that in solid state physics, I mean, you know, you had some uh, work in solid state physics a long time ago. Uh, I'm not at all an expert, but I know that people think about which, which, what, the K points take in the Brian zone, small K points, you know, uh, those Balderi kind of points, or I don't know. I'm not Balderesky, in... yeah. Balderesky, et cetera. And we can do the same kind of things in the uh, Brian zone uh, uh, for yeah. boundary condition. So yes. certain must have a way of choosing the big K point and the way of averaging, which is uh, minimize the finite that effect. That, that's true. But here I have no, no, yeah. I didn't think yes. at all in that. But it, right. it could, it could even show, give some kind of uncertainty on this effect. Right. Yes, absolutely. You're right. That would be a nice thing to see how, yes. Because, you know, people are, typically they take uh, periodic, condi periodic condition and uh, they look at uh, the extrapolate, but there's only one K point. I clearly, that if you take a cloud of k-points, if you look at the sensitivity of the choice of k-points, etc., you would be able eventually, as you said, to quantify a little more what is the trust we can have in the extrapolation and some sort of error bar, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... Are there any, any other uh, questions or comments? Well, if not, I will definitely uh, thank Michelle again. Thank you very much.